Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us at Startup Grind this morning. Uh, today's event is brought to you by Spark Center. Uh, we are the Regional Innovation Center in Durham Region. And as the Eastern Ontario chapter of Startup Grind, Spark Center is thrilled to bring you these monthly events to inspire, motivate, and challenge you. So first and foremost, I'd like to acknowledge Spark Center's elite partners, Bearskin and Par, LLP, Finance Without Borders, RDP Associates, Layton, Suresh Law, Real Estate Refreshed, and Coldwell Banker. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Christina Savannah, and I am the marketing director for Spark Center. Uh, first and foremost, I want to take a minute to encourage you all to check out Spark Center's quarterly publication. Uh, it's called the Spark Business and Innovation Magazine. Our summer 2023 issue is about to uh, be released, and it's all about robotics and AI. If you are interested in a copy, you can visit the sparkmagazine.ca to subscribe for your free print and or digital copy copy. Uh, the media kit is also available too if you're interested in advertising with us as well. All right, the interview portion of today's event will begin shortly, but don't forget to stay tuned after the interview for some networking. If you haven't tried the networking on the Hopin platform before, it's pretty fun, it's easy to do, and it's a great way to meet some uh, new faces in the community. I'm super excited for today's discussion and I'm thrilled to welcome today's moderator, Natalie Prochitko from uh, the CEO of the Whitby Chamber of Commerce to the stage. Thanks, Christina. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, you always get the opportunity on these platforms to put down something under your name. And uh, typically we always write, you know, who we are and what we do. But I am very passionate about entrepreneurship. So I consider this an absolute uh, privilege to have a conversation uh, on your behalf. Uh, with such an amazing entrepreneur and community supporter. So i um, very happy to be here. Welcome to Startup Grind, everyone. And uh, I, again, thank you for the opportunity to host. My name is Natalie Prochitko. I'm the proud CEO of the Whitby Chamber of Commerce. And there are eight chambers and boards of trades in the region. We are the largest, which makes me extremely proud. So this is a big opportunity. I'm uh, quite a fangirl, if you haven't noticed already, of Isaac, a serial entrepreneur, a positive force in our business community. And uh, Isaac and, and his amazing team have supported many chamber events, and it makes me very thankful and very proud. So if you want to learn about us, reach out. I'll put some things in the chat throughout uh, this discussion, and I will be watching for questions. So if you have any, make sure you type them into the chat. Uh, even if I feel like on, you know, interrupting Isaac, and if it's a topical question uh, to have during the conversation rather than waiting until the end, I will do that as best as I can. Uh, the Whitby Chamber offers 80 networking opportunities a year. Lots of our programming is free, uh, and the idea is to build your business, save you money, and take a leadership role in this community. So let's welcome Isaac to the stage. Isaac. Hey. Isaac. <laughs> What's up, Natalie? How are you? Hey, hey, I'm fine. Thank you. It's great to see you. 20 years. Congratulations to you and to the Geek team. Woo it, you know what? We're, we're making a big deal of it. And sometimes we kind of just get caught in what we do and don't realize. But 20 years of doing anything uh is, is a very long time so we're very very proud of what what we've accomplished and continue to accomplish for sure you absolutely should be you should absolutely be proud of yourselves um thank you for making time to chat with us today as i mentioned i'm going to look for uh questions uh but we do have some pre-prepared so i'm going to launch into them and sure. then decide if i want to take a right or turn left or... <laughs> i'll i'll, I'll uh, follow I'll, you lead i'll follow don't, that. Be, <laughs> don't be frightened okay so awesome. tell me, entrepreneurship, was this something you decided uh, was your passion very early in life or did it kind of come to you later in life? Give us a, give us a bit of a 101 on, on Isaac and entrepreneurship. Yeah, I, I think myself, like a lot of entrepreneurs, it's not really something you decide, it's something that's innately in you, right? Mm -hmm. You're a kid uh, in, in, in grade school who goes and buys a, a pack of chicken nuggets and sells each one for a dollar uh, at, at lunchtime. So I think it's something that is part of, of, uh, of, of your personality. And I think later on, as you become a professional, uh, you kind of just bring that with you. Uh, I'm from uh, Uganda, as, uh, as a, lot of, a lot of people know. And, and in Africa, entrepreneurship is really a way of, of life. It's how, uh, you know, how families support themselves. I mean, 
uh, you know, a farmer will grow something, they'll take it uh, to the front of the road and they'll sell it. Uh, you know, uh, a, a mom or a parent in the city will get, you know, clothes and they'll open up a stall uh, in the market and, and, and sell that to pay you know, school fees and, and everything else to support their family. So I think entrepreneurship is just a part of where I'm from and part of my culture and has always been a part of my personality way before uh, I started Geeks Be Commerce. Got it. Got it. So, so okay, it's part of your history. It's part of your culture. It's where you're from. Yep. But can you tell us a little bit about if there was somebody in particular that influenced you or a particular time in your life that really, really influenced your passion for entrepreneurship? Yeah, it's, it's a very, very good question, Natalie. And I think it kind of goes back to uh, how, how I was raised. And, and, and I'm going to go back to way before I came to Canada. It, it was seeing uh, my the family. Uh, I'm, I'm from a, a you know a, a part of Uganda called Mbale, which is you know the eastern part. And I grew up. Uh, my, my family were farmers, right? So you know we're growing coffee, we're growing bananas, and just that being part of my my foundation, my formation, kind of really was part of that story. And see my grandmother, uh, you know, grow things and then you know largely coffee and, and turn around and sell it. So uh, very early on, I think I was meant to be an entrepreneur and I, I went down a path that was contrary to that. And I eventually came back to it. Uh, I, I went, as a lot of people know, I, I went to uh, uh, what's now TMU, Ryerson at that time, uh, to be an urban planner. And despite all that notion, I came back onto entrepreneurship and started my own company. So it's just something that I, I think has always been uh, uh, in part of part of my who I am. And even while I was there, I was starting businesses that were urban planning related, but they were consulting businesses. So it was inevitable that I was going to uh, be the owner. Yeah. Grandmothers, they all have so much influence. Obviously, the hard working it's it's embedded yeah. in your DNA now, right? Your grandmother would be very proud, regardless of where she is. Yeah, well, um, she's actually right behind me. So she watches over me in the back there. That's a, a photo of her. Love and, it. Yeah, she's such a strong spirit and such a, with a very strong influence in my life. So uh, you're absolutely right. That they're, they're magical. They're magical. They are. Yeah. They are. My mother always said it is way more fun and much easier to be a grandmother than a mother. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's very true. Not that I want that now, but uh, <laughs> one day. Yeah. I, hope, uh, I hope to be as influential in, in someone's life the way your grandmother was in yours. Okay. Um, so Absolutely. you kind of teased us a little bit about uh, having gone into urban planning. Yes. Um, but tell us, tell us, give us a little overview of your career. And, you know, yes, people can read a bio or a synopsis, yes. but give us a little bit of a, a 101, because I find it quite interesting is how Geek Speak evolved based on sort of your sort of serial entrepreneurship. So so tell us, give us a bit of history there. Absolutely. So it was, it was definitely a, an interesting journey. And uh, as, I, as, as I mentioned, when I, you know, I went to, to school uh, in Ontario, and I was uh, one of the, the outputs of, of Ontario's education system, and which I think is an, an amazing uh, place to learn and grow. Uh, I, I went to a Catholic school in Toronto. And when I was leaving grade 13, which was a thing at that time, and I, I think it was an amazing program that, uh, that should never have gone away. Uh, I wasn't sure what my direction was. I knew that I was very interested in, in social issues. I knew that uh, I had a strong interest in, in geography and, and all those things that kind of related to that. So I was like, well, what was a career path? So I uh, literally sat with guidance and like, let's find something that kind of fits uh, in terms of what your skill sets are. And that's how I ended up uh, in, in land use planning. So it was a very rigorous program, uh, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of content creation, a lot of policy writing, a lot of presentation and communication type skills that uh, eventually helped me in what I do today. Uh, very, very strong influences. I actually had the opportunity to speak with one of my, my early professors at Ryerson, a guy named Joe Springer, and talk about people who've had influence in you. Uh, he was one of those people and he, you know, we had a call and he's like, oh my God, Isaac, I found you on LinkedIn. I, I don't look at LinkedIn and I can't believe uh, this is you. And so we spoke and he said, Isaac, I actually remember you, and I don't remember a lot of people because I've taught, you know, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of students, but I remember this conversation we had, and, and it was literally, you know, Isaac, you've got something, but you need to get your act together. You need to focus on what you're doing. So it was those moments and being part of that that kind of spurred me to kind of really focus on, on where I wanted to be. So I, I left land use planning, uh, eventually uh, got a, a, an undergrad degree. Uh, and then went into uh, government affairs, which was kind of like a, a segue. And I worked with uh, with Bell Canada at that time. 
uh, of course, I'd had done a whole bunch of part-time gigs uh, as, uh, along the way, but uh, government affairs with that group was one of the earliest sort of professional uh, you know, capacities that I had. So in that case, you're, you're working with municipalities, you're talking about rights of way, which was kind of like a good segue because that's what I had trained for. Uh, eventually, kind of came to be that really that's not where I wanted to be. So I ended up uh, working for uh, an ad agency uh, in Toronto that had Bell Canada as an account. So it's kind of moved into there. And now I'm doing you know project management. And at that time, uh, the internet is really becoming a thing. That was like uh, uh, the late 90s where uh, it, we're not quite shopping online, but websites still cost $100,000 to build because there's no Shopify or, or templates to run it. Uh, but it kind of aligned with my interest in technology early on, right? I was kind of that, that tech geek. I always wanted the, how a laptop works, and I wanted to connect my BlackBerry to my phone so I could get uh, my text message in real time. So in that space, it kind of spurred uh, that interest in technology. But I also was front and center in terms of how you know agencies work, how brands work, how you manage you know working with these large customers. Uh, very early, early on, how you run meetings and how you, you write briefs. So as I passed to you know one agency to another, I kind of brought that with me, and I kind of you know learned a lot, obviously outside school in terms of living in those spaces. So you know, in when I started my own thing, working with these large brands, I had, had a very good basis in terms of how to pitch, how to write, and so on, so on and so forth. So eventually. Uh, you know, I, I, I got the opportunity, I was given the opportunity as a result of downsizing. Sorry, Isaac, we're going in a different direction. Okay. Uh, and it was that spurring moment that kind of said, well, you know what, I could kind of do my own thing here, right? And uh, I ended up, my first gig as, as GeekSpeak was, you know, doing a technical writing uh, uh, an opportunity with, with Ontario government that a friend of mine had aligned me with. So all of a sudden, I'm seeing that, okay, people will pay you. Uh, for your for your skill set, yeah. uh, and then from there, you know, Geek Speak is really born, and now we I'm, I'm getting other team members around me, and you know, I'm still running this uh, as a one person shop, uh, but I'm I'm building work for clients, and then I'm going back to the same agencies that I used to work with, and I'm like, well, this is what I'm doing. Let's outsource here a little bit. Uh, now I'm outsourcing, but I'm working on Vaseline, and I'm working on General Motors, and so on and so forth. And eventually, e-commerce becomes really how. Uh, people begin to buy things and then you know make this this pivot and say you know what i don't want to work as a sub to these large agencies we want direct client relationships and then from there uh you're not only competing with these uh large agencies but you're beating them because now you're specializing uh and uh and, and that's really where the growth has been sorry long long answer there i don't know if i answered no no but i mean it's an important thing because sometimes people think opportunities or jobs or career paths um don't actually matter but they do because what you've just described to us is leveling up learning and applying leveling up and then that aha moment that you had which was my god people are going to pay me for this well that's it wow. yeah right I, I can't I can't state that enough. There's this notion that you know working for somebody uh, is, is 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 not worthy. Just just leave right. and go on. There's, there's people who do very very well, but as an entrepreneur, kind of working in somebody else's business helps you understand that business, right? Right. Both for the good and the bad. What is a culture that they have in there? How are mm -hmm. they talking to clients? How are they handling when things work uh, you know work well or don't work well? How are they winning customers? So when you leave and you're starting your own shop, there's a basis for there. And especially mm -hmm. if you work at a number of places. And for me, literally, that's what uh, has helped me. And so when I'm working with my team here uh, and, and, and we're pitching projects, it's really bringing that basis that when you, this is what a presentation is supposed to look like, right? Because if GM is going to buy from you, this is what they expect to see. Right. I don't get that if I haven't worked in a space. Right. So you're pulling on all of that experience and all those all those opportunities you had to learn. It wasn't a waste of time. No, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Right. It, right. It, it was invaluable. It was invaluable. Right. And it, it gives you that that confidence because you've been here before. Right. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and you know exactly what you're talking about. Love it. I, you know, I was listening to you, the whole land use and policy writing government affairs. I mean, that could be a whole other career. Uh, trajectory for you one day when you get kind of bored with geek speak, maybe make it to 30 and then, you know, kill it and run mm -hmm. off and work in government, maybe become a politician because land use is obviously is a critical conversation these days. So 
just a plot. Yeah, you know what? The notion, the, the area of interest for me, and I did my thesis on community economic development, uh, which is probably why I'm so passionate about where I live and right. the region I live in and the country that I'm in. So that notion that you could build a better society by uplifting everybody was something that I really enjoyed. Feel too. Uh, yeah, yeah. In, being, in, in being in school and the fact that you could use business and you hear about microfinancing and you know support small business because that's who raises an entire community to me. I think is very very important. Yeah, right. so I mean, that is, to me is is still part of my my area of interest and obviously being part of the business community here and the larger community kind of fulfills that uh, as part of that. So 20 years, I'm going to ask about kind of your biggest contributors to your success, but we did have a question in the chat. Yep. And the question was, so when you founded Geek Speak, did you do so on your own or did you have a partner when you launched? Thanks, yeah. Sonia. Yeah, so this is this is this was all a one man show. So when I started Geek Speak, I would I would, I would call uh, somebody like the, the Whippy Chamber and say, well, uh, I'm Isaac from Geek Speak Commerce and uh, you know, my company does copywriting. I want to work with your small businesses. And you'd say, well, great, let's refer you to all these small, then I'd write the content myself. Right. So I was doing the, and, and I think it's probably one of the, the things that I enjoy about my, my business and much less now, but there's no aspect of what we do at Geekspeak that I can't personally do, right? Okay. Uh, I know how to open Photoshop. I could obviously write content. I, I could do, you know, photo like it just makes me better in terms of uh, speaking and mm. uh, and, and, and talking to prospects. Now, obviously, there's a design team that's way over here in terms of skill level, but those technical uh, abilities kind of change uh, how you how you talk about how you understand what you're selling, right? right. And right. how you solve your client's problem because it's it's real, right? So uh, to answer that question, you know, I launched. I was I was a one person show, and as the skill sets grew broader and broader, obviously, I can do everything. So now you've got an amazing design lead in Kathy, as an example, who leads our team here. Uh, we've got, uh, you know, Trish who leads the operation and the, the success lead. We've got a, a layer of CSM. So it's, it's sometimes uh, clients that, oh, like, I didn't know those guys were a client because the team is just so broad and, and they're so sophisticated and, 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 and equipped in what they do that uh, I don't have to be everywhere, which is ultimately where you want to get when you empower and, and, and grow a business. Mm -hmm. Well, and you're supposed to be the visionary. So 20 years. Well, that's it. When you look back in yep. 20 years, what would you say? Give us kind of the biggest, uh, you know, not a list this big because I got lots of questions. <laughs> what, so you kind of look back and I'm sure you've had discussions about your anniversary. What was the biggest contributor in those 20 years? What was that? You know, it's one thing to go, aha, people are going to pay me for this. And then you start right. applying sort of that, the aspects you've just described, right, right. in terms of leadership. What were what were those big contributors? What is it a particular client? Was it winning a particular piece of business? Was it a a size hitting a particular milestone in terms of the number of people that work for you? What would you say were those big contributors? Yeah, so there's, there's definitely been a, a, a number of contributors. Uh, definitely a, a strong, skilled team has been mm -hmm. key to our growth, right? Because we're judged on the quality of the work we do. Yes, people. Yeah, we like you, Isaac. You're a nice guy, uh, but ultimately, it's uh, you know, are you delivering on the promise you're making? So, a, a strong, uh, well-equipped team uh, and, and well, uh, you know, skilled team is very important. Uh, but I think one of the key areas for us was really, you know, we started off as a marketing company that was kind of did all this, right? So we would help with your, you know, trade show stuff, and we'd help with you with your your general marketing and your web and so on. But there came a point where we specialized in, in one key area, right? So we kind of still dabbled, but our key area was we are the e-commerce expert in Canada, right? So, you know, whether you're uh, a massive, you know, agency that's making $300 million, you can't compete with this elite team of e-commerce experts. So we made that a, a strategy and in an area where um, a lot of our competitors were not spending a lot of time. Right. So in terms of our growth and you look at, uh, you know, a lot of the brands we've been fortunate to work with. And, and I, I take that very, very seriously. And it's because we specialize. Right. They could uh, you know, they, they could go to the agency to do the television and all these big components. But when it comes to I need to solve my e-commerce challenge, I need to solve my, you know, my strategy on Amazon. Uh, who do I call for that? And ultimately, mm -hmm. I think that specialization was a pivotal moment that 
really drove that curve. So as you are building your business and as you're thinking about, well, where do I compete? Where should I be? Uh, it's kind of good to kind of explore as, as you build, but ultimately specializing and being the leader or one of the leaders in, in, in a narrow area. Uh, the market may be you know, smaller and, and, and so forth, but the opportunity to grow, certainly from my experience, uh, has, has been critical. Okay. Thank you. Um, so you, you, I love how you speak about your team as being an elite team because it ties directly into that being a special, having that specialization. So the, the language you use is actually really inspiring, um, even from a leadership perspective. So the business has obviously changed and your business has evolved. So hear you loud and clear from an entrepreneurship perspective. Um, and you touched on it slightly. Can, can you talk about that how the business has evolved so the concept of and i know when i worked in it it was everybody you were either a promotion house or a digital marketing house or yes. a advertising agency or a branding agency and now it's become sort of mothership and one organization manages sort of a multi aspect solution to a business yet right. you remain a specialist yes it's very sexy and in, in this day and age there's not a lot of that anymore because it's all honed under one umbrella. Everybody wants right. to be all things to everyone. Right, right. So would you say, so for people listening, right, there are people who who are in that place where they're thinking, yeah, I'm really, really good at this, but should I be broader or should I start creating partnerships that, that provide us with a broader suite of services? Right. Yeah, that's, that's actually uh, the last point is probably where... Um, uh, a lot of thinking goes sometimes because you know when you think about how broad you want to be and, and how good you want to be at all those elements you have to think about well how am i going to build this team right mm -hmm. so if you're going to become a uh, you know, database specialist or, or information architects or if you want to have uh, you know a website now you're going to think about i got to bring all these people do i keep them in house and, and so on so being able to narrow it allows you to manage the resources you have which is which are often very limited manage your payroll uh, but you don't necessarily have to kind of turn away things that are not front and center. And that, to your last point, is how can we work with partners to bring bring in in order to solve a client's problem? And we and we do we do that all the time. And we are often also brought in by larger agencies who have these amazing client relationships, uh, but they need uh, to fulfill this one gap within uh, within their solution uh, to be able to solve that. So there's, there's nothing wrong with partnering. I, I encourage it. It has actually opened uh, the door for us into brands in some cases that we would never have been able to work with directly, right? Yeah. So it's like uh, somebody says, well, you know, we've got this client, they're a large uh, beverage company, but, you know, they're struggling with Amazon. We're doing all their stuff here, but we know that Geekspeak is the, the go-to for Amazon strategy. Can you be part of this conversation? And we have no problem doing that. So it just means that, we're not having to cycle and sell every, uh, every every client we get. We're leveraging those relations to do that. So if I'm a founder and I'm yep. trying to figure out the lens that I evaluate a partnership, right? I try to go get the correct kind of a partner or yep. I'm evaluating for a mentor. What, yep. what should be what should be sort of my top lenses that I, that that were, have worked for you in terms of evaluating those those? Yeah. Relationships? Yeah. So, no, the, the partnership thing is a good question, uh, and, and I founded uh, Geeks Be Commerce really without a partner. Uh, I kind of just went out there and I started doing it. I'm like, okay, and, 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 and things figure themselves. But I'm, I'm in even as we talk right now, I'm kind of brainstorming some additional startups that I'm going to be part of, but with partners as well. Okay. So the conversation ultimately is, what is a compliment in terms of what the partner is bringing to the, to the table? Are they a business founder? Are they uh, are they a technical founder, right? Uh, are they bringing relationships into it uh, that 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 you may you may not have, right? Uh, mm -hmm. They have the same passion for this project. Is it as meaningful to them as it is to you, right? Because there's nothing worse than, you know, this this is a hundred percent for me. This is all I got, and then somebody has really this is just ten percent side gig uh, that that I'm doing because you know you know I get a nothing lot. better to do today. Yeah. Okay. yeah. From a standpoint, it's, it's hard to find um, somebody who's on, on that same level and, and have that same passion and the same, really the same geared interest to which we're going. But I think that's because mm -hmm. this means you're both eating and sleeping. Uh, that's success. The right. risk is cleared and, and more importantly, the passion for where you're going. 
No, so that's on the partner side. Uh, but as far as mentors, I, I think they're 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 amazing. That they're great uh, to find. They're not always easy to find because people who are good at what they do are very very busy. But if you could get somebody who is in your space or is where you want to be, I think is where critically uh, you want to begin looking, right? So uh, you know, is their business two or three uh, you know years ahead of where you are? Maybe 10, 20 years ahead of where you are. Uh, and is there a personality fit? And is more and more importantly, do they have the time for you? And you know, you kind of don't don't step and say, "Well, I'm just starting. Build my business for me. Walk me through everything you did." Uh, it's more so, okay, this is where I want to be. I got these questions. Give me an hour of your time. Mm -hmm. I, I'll, I'll do work and I'll come back in two weeks and say what I did. Now, I, because of obviously the, the amount of work that I've, that I've done, I get approached uh, often and I'm always open and, and open to talk to people. But what frustrates me is somebody who I'll sit with, because uh, and, and, I'm, I'm passionate about entrepreneurs, I'll spend the time and I'll spend an hour and time with you and we'll walk through everything. But if you go away and then you're coming back, you know, a month later with, okay, we're well, in the same place where you were, then you're not making the use of my time. Right. So if you're right. going to approach somebody, be clear, have very clear questions and then go do something with it. Right. Because they, yeah, they, we... they want to know that they're pushing you. There's results for what they're doing as well. Right. They're not a business consultant. No, they're, they're, not. they're mentoring and we've with yeah. the chambers got a mentorship program yeah. and the accountability rests on the mentee. Yeah. You need to own it, own the outcome. You need to schedule the time. You need to show that there's progress and results. Otherwise don't waste the mentor's time to your point. Exactly. Um, exactly. We have a question. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk about or ask you about the journey of entrepreneurship. Yep. But before we do, there was a question that that talks about the fact that you help businesses and small businesses in terms yep. of online sales, right? Getting yep. you're the e-commerce expert. What are you seeing right now for the demand for e-commerce and small business? Yeah, so you know, we we have these conversations uh, really quite often with mm -hmm. with brands and customers of, of all sizes. So one of the things that obviously the past you know 24, 36 months have shown is that uh, you know. Customers are ready, uh, and you know when, when when the opportunity is there to shop online. Those behaviors have been set, right? So if you if you're selling product, uh, it's a channel you largely cannot ignore because your customers are going to be there. They may come to you in store, but this is part of how people buy everything now, right? And that is true for you know 18 year olds as as it is for 75 year olds, right? So it's right across the board in terms of where that is. Now, from a, a business startup point, it is one of the fastest ways to get up and going with a launch, right? I could launch, you know, a, a Shopify store and be selling product in two, three days, mm -hmm. right? So as far as a strategy to, is my product going to work? I want to really test this out. Are people interested in what I'm doing? Well, before I start thinking about, do I channel this into, into Walmart? Do I channel this into into Loblaws, I could actually test my product right. using right. e-commerce. So strategically, uh, the, the platforms are there, they're very robust, they're very e inexpensive uh, to set up. Uh, and um, you know, the customers are now much more so than ever you know, comfortable and they're buying groceries, they're buying everything uh, under the sun on, uh, through, through e-commerce. Got it. Okay, so let's go back to your journey, entrepreneurship. Yep. What's your favorite, most favorite part? Uh, I like inventing things. I like inventing processes. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just like coming up with, uh, you know, things that I know will work that end up working, right? So okay. when we come up with uh, with a, a new technology that, that we, we, we try internally, uh, you know, or a, a new way of doing things that works out, that's what excites me the most. It's also, you know, the innovation and saying, this is what's happening in the world right now. How do we bring that in? That's mm -hmm. what, that's really what excites me uh, as, as an entrepreneur and being in the capacity that I am, I have the freedom to do that. And I have a work culture where the team knows that we're going to try this and it's like, we're the boss of us. Why can't we do it? <laughs> right. And nobody's telling us what to do. So it's that sort of uh, energy that is certainly infectious within an organization mm -hmm. that I love about being an entrepreneur. And, you know, I can say, well, I'm going to do a startup over here and, and being able to do that and, and not having to be 
go through layers and layers of approval. I got to submit this, and it's yeah. just that, that flexibility that I think that was really stifled in corporate world. Right. 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 So being on your own, obviously, that comes with risks. You take everything that comes with that. I don't want to make it all, you know, nothing, uh, nothing to consider. But I'd have to say that's one of my favorite things. That always that also comes from leadership, right? Give yourself some kudos. So often you get to a point where you're piloting or trying something or failing, which is yeah. you know a big fear, starts right. scaring people, right? So it's it's easy to kind of say to the team, yeah, maybe not today, right? Starting to become risk adverse. So it's well, great that you you still inspire that least favorite. Yeah. Part. <laughs> no. What's the least favorite part of entrepreneurship? What's the least favorite part? Least. This is. Um, I guess it varies from entrepreneur to entrepreneur, entrepreneur, but I, if I was to classify, classify myself, I'd probably say I'm more of a, what are we doing next? Where are we going? Where's the industry going? How do we make sure we're, we're on there? So I'd probably be more of a visionary entrepreneur, if, if you want to call it that, uh, than anything else. So what that leads to me to define as my least favorite part is when I have to get into the minutia of things, right? Okay when i have to uh cra says okay we need all this paperwork and this has to be here you need to submit all this and whatever it just drives me nuts mm -hmm. uh so it's really the those sort of uh and, and, and they have to be done and if you're going to run a successful business and, and pay people properly and whatever all those processes have to be in place and if you can't do them yourself get the the teams to do that for you and we, we're fortunate to have a very uh, you know, amazing team of our a source point, which is a local business that takes care of our payroll and all these and where are the hours and this is what they need. So that's probably, and they're all saying, you know, Isaac, we need this piece of paper and we need this expense and that, whatever. I'm like, can you just let me go figure out this new AR thing <laughs> as opposed to having to- Got it. Do, uh, yeah, so- The minutia. Yeah, it's those things that drive me yes. nuts. Obviously, I understand that it's important, uh, but that's probably the the one part that you obviously as a, as a CEO, as a fan, or as, a, as a, the lead executive, you have to do all this, but you also have to take care of the mechanics uh, of, of the business. People have to get paid right. properly. People have yeah, to people are properly. counting on you. Yeah, you gotta, yeah, you gotta, you gotta <laughs> run, you gotta run, run the business. It's not right. just, you just dream stuff up. Got it. So you're in downtown Whitby and you touched a little on economic development. This is uh, one of our, one of our questions. Sure. So I'm gonna turn us a little. Um, but it's related, right? Because you're you're part of a fabric in, in downtown Whitby, but you're also part of a fabric of the region, right? Yep. And you've mentioned loving sort of economic development and being part of that fabric. So what's the what's the biggest opportunity in the Durham region, you think, for business? And and what do you wish you'd had provided to you in this market right. to have made your life a little easier? Right. So uh what I, I see today that wasn't there when I started 20 years ago is uh, in, some, in some sense, some of, some of the support systems that, that exist right now. So like mm -hmm. Spark, as an example, as an incubator did not exist 20 years ago. Uh, 1855 as an institution did not exist 20 years ago. So a lot of these are opportunities for entrepreneurs now to kind of take advantage, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that being said, I think that Durham has a unique opportunity to be uh, an innovation, an innovation destination, right? Let's foster, uh, you know, places like Sparks who are interested in uh, in, in companies that want to do uh, knowledge-based type work, right? So companies like Geekspeak, uh, companies who are maybe at the 1855 who are trying to get themselves together and get something out there. Right. So I think there's a unique opportunity there. I mean, uh, we've got, you know, colleges and university within uh there's, there's one within 15 minutes, others within you know 45 minutes and an hour. So the, the talent is definitely there. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've also seen uh, interest in, 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 Dur in Durham as an international destination, right? There's companies all over the world looking for places to locate that have uh, great quality of life, access to housing, uh, you know, transportation networks. I mean, we've seen Amazon begin to pop up. So all these large you know, companies that are beginning to be part of this region are themselves going to spur uh, the growth of related uh, you know, type business around this. I think that's a unique opportunity in the region right now. Uh, and I think it's really saying, okay, we, we, we want to make it a mandate. We think it's important that uh, companies like Geekspeak and the next Geekspeak and the Geekspeak after that are find this a place that they could grow it, right? And certainly that 
you know, with the work that the chamber does as an example, uh, just supporting, just cheerleading. Sometimes it's just, here's what's happening in our community and we want to know about it. And those reposts are all part of that. You know, let's, let's lift them all up. I, I hear what you're saying. Sometimes there's so much happening in this community that it's hard to keep track. So I'm glad, uh, I'm glad you gave us a little plug because we try our best to do that. Um, one of my questions here, and it relates to one that's actually in the, uh, in the um, chat. So uh, I wanted to talk about roadblocks. And to me, often when we speak to an entrepreneur, they're saying, ah, oh, it's so crowded out there. There's right. tech and there's tools and networking opportunities. And I, I, you know, how do I make a decision? I already have, I only have so much time. I have a finite right. amount of time and resource. Right. What do I do? How do I stand out? So what right. would you say to a, to a business person who wants to stand out in this crowded marketplace? Yeah, so I, I think for us, it starts well, well, where, way before you get caught up in, in the technology and all the tools and whatever the case is, it's the core of your offering. What is your business? Uh, so when I started out, I, I, I was helping small businesses create marketing materials that's mm. what they call, right? Like one of my early, earliest customers, and I think they paid me something like, you know, $150. They, they were a labor placement business uh, and they really needed a brochure that they could hand to potential customers to go out. So well, way before I figured out what's my accounting system and what is my marketing, whatever, the, the business offering itself is clear, right? So ultimately, that's what's going to differentiate you between uh, your, your, your competition. Are you doing... Uh, the job as, as good or better than what somebody else is doing. Then after that, we, we kind of balloon out into, well, how am I uh, servicing these customers? So, you know, what are my email you know, systems look like? Uh, how am I, you know, managing and tracking my team? Are we using project management tools to do that? But all that at, 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 the, at the kernel is, what is your offering? What is your service? And even today, we've got a lot of tools at, at GeekSpeed, right? But ultimately, our customers are not hiring us for our tools. They're hiring us for, can you help us drive conversion on, on, on our website, right? You know, are we selling more product as a result of working uh, with, with you and your team? Did we solve this problem? So, you know, that standing out is be the best uh, or be as good as the best in terms of what you do. And then everything else kind of grows out of that. If that okay. Makes. So, yes, it's crowded, but know what you're doing and do it well. And it becomes less crowded very quickly. Okay, Absolutely. gotcha. Yeah, and, Related, and sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. ahead. On that, you know, when you're starting a business, where should I start my business? What market is? And yeah. you always look at what is the size of the market, right? So there may be, uh, you, know, you know, 10, 15, 30 players. But if you're talking about, you know, a billion dollar market, there's room for you in that market, right? So if your market is only a million dollars and there's already you know, you know, 100 suppliers, obviously there's gonna be a lot more competition in there. So in assessing, are there too many people? That's mm -hmm. fine, but really how big is the overall pie? Uh, and, and that's both locally and internationally, right? That's something else we have to think about in terms of determining, am I in the right business? Got it. Yeah. Okay. So similar to that in terms of um, it being a crowded, place and wanting to stand out there's a question in the chat uh that speaks to influencer marketing yeah and what are your thoughts in terms of how influencer marketing is impacting e-commerce brands so are you hearing uh that that that's a topic or a hot topic yeah yeah that's such a very interesting uh space uh because what you know social media has done and the internet in general has really shifted how brands and retailers market right uh, generally speaking, you know, consumers find content from their beer, their peers or testimonies from their peers to be a lot more authentic than what the brand tells you. So it's why we go on YouTube and, 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 and listen to somebody give me the review on my MacBook instead of the glossy imaging that Apple gives me, right? It just seems uh, a lot more real. And this is why reviews on websites, when you mm -hmm. find a product, you say, okay, well, yeah, I see what the brand is telling me, but what what is Jenny from Sudbury saying about, about about this about this about this about this whatever it is that I'm buying? So all that is within that realm of influencer marketing, where we expect that people who are like us are going to be more truthful and telling us about the product. 
so whether it's in e-commerce otherwise there's definitely a role and a room for that mm -hmm. and for us as a brand uh believe it or not uh you know natalie when you post something and you say something about geek speak you're influencer marketing on our behalf because you're speaking about it about our brand when we're not speaking about it ourselves and ultimately that's where uh we want to be mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. as a business so let's leverage these testimonials that other people are saying about our brand about our product about our service so we we're not the ones saying well we're the best there's other people say you know what i have never worked with another team like that you need to call these guys and ultimately so when an influencer is holding up a product and saying you know what i use this and it was amazing whether that's a mom influencer or whether it's a, a, a mechanic that's using a product whether it's a uh, a kid that's holding up a crayon that they just colored with all that speaks to the authenticity of that testimony that is different from the brand telling you that. And ultimately that's where influencer marketing has, has fallen in. Got it. It's that organic conversation in all those mediums. Exactly. Now, mm -hmm. sometimes it's paid for, obviously because brands will pay, but ultimately right. we expect that influencers are going to be more truthful, if you will, more authentic in their assessment of a product than what the brand themselves are telling you. Okay. So, We've talked about, you, you've kind of, you're taking us on a journey a little, right? From yeah. your career to specialization to uh, thank you to those who are uh, putting questions in the chat. And Stacey, I see yours. Just give me one sec. Um, if you had to go back, so often an entrepreneur is, it's exhausting, right? You, you're trying and trying and trying. And we've heard words like crowded marketplace and how to yeah. get, you know, people organically to talk about you. What would you do differently? So, if you could go back, you've had 20 years of geek speak. Right. What would you have done differently? What if you could have heard someone sitting on your shoulder saying, don't go in that direction? <laughs> so, what would I say to my 20 year old class, Isaac? I think that's pretty a much. Yeah. What well, were you thinking? What were yeah. you thinking? Yeah. Honestly, I, yeah. I don't think, I mean, there's lessons that I've learned that things that are done sooner and I'll get to those. But generally speaking, I don't think there's many things I would have done too differently. Hmm. So, uh, Geekspeak is 20 years old, but bef well before Geekspeak stars, I think I had maybe three other attempts, right, at, okay. at starting a company. So I'm, I'm wearing a shirt that says, launch something. And until you launch something, you don't know what you don't know, right? So I all say, hurry up and fail. Hurry up and get your first business out of there. Maybe it's, in, you know, you're selling product or launch a lemonade stand if that's what you need to do but each one of those experiences is what's gonna what you bring and learn to the ultimate business that may be the business you you you, you get who's to say if geek speak is the business that's going to be the isaac wanzama business right. so uh right. all that to say you know you know uh, each step along the way and each business you, you some may last only six months some mm -hmm. you may attempt to start something with a partner then you just learn with okay next time i pick a partner for a business it's going to be like this or i'm not going down the partnership route again because whatever this case is so i learned early and i started uh businesses and i was involved in a whole bunch of different startups and brainstorming with people so all that i wouldn't really change hmm. in geek speak what i probably have done uh, a little bit you know earlier on uh is is probably and, and, and I look back, uh, our website is our sort of our core marketing tools. It's how we get we, we get in there. Uh, there's things that we're doing right now that we had probably would have done a lot sooner. Uh, and specifically, for example, we have like a lead form uh, on a website that says, you know, if you want to reach us, just fill out these three things and you get to us. We didn't put on a lead form for like three years, four years after our website had been up right so little tactics like that that would have probably driven our capture um, right. we didn't do we could have done a lot sooner uh, the one that i often talk about was is google advertising right how do we get targeted traffic you know into our into our website and into our uh, into our shop with people looking for the services we have mm. uh, we did it took us a long time before we realized oh my god i gotta spend this money on advertising to get people to say well this is what you do right. so small tactics like that i would have probably done a little bit sooner uh, to do it. And we constantly, we're tweaking and we're evolving and we're changing how that works. But uh, as far as would I have just stuck with one company, it probably wouldn't have been Geeks, we could have been something else, right? So all those steps and missteps, more importantly, uh, I, I probably wouldn't have changed. Got it. 
So, so clearly as an entrepreneur, and I think many of many entrepreneurs out there uh, have a higher risk tolerance. Yes. Right. So those, those who are not entrepreneurs are, you would probably say are risk adverse. So you agree with that statement? Can you speak to it? Uh, I, I mean, I look at myself and I say that, do I have a higher risk tolerance than anybody else? I mean, I put on my seatbelt and, and, and I drive in the same way, I drive at a speed limit. So I don't think it's so much the risk uh, uh, aversion uh, or, or risk tolerance, but I think it's more being willing to fail at something, right? Having the confidence, okay. you know what, if I do this, like you kind of say, what's the worst that could happen? And then you work it backwards and say, okay, right. that's not that bad. Right, I could start. Right. I could start this company in six months. Uh, you know, it, does, it doesn't exist anymore. And if that's the worst that could happen, what have I gained from out of that? Yes. Right. So I think entrepreneurs are just more willing to take those chances, mm -hmm. and a lot of time they fail. But when they do get rewarded, they get rewarded in a big way. Right. right? So yeah. it's, so it's that personality overall, and then once obviously you're going this overall longer term career benefits of being an entrepreneur versus not. I see some of the brands that you work on. Holy camoly, right? We could only dream. Right? Right, right. What's your North Star? If somebody could wave a magic wand and, and award Geek Speak with like the client, the ah, I got to sink my teeth into their business. Who would right. it be? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting one. I, I mean, there was a time where we didn't have monster clients and it was kind of like, well, oh my God, it would be if we had this, if we had that. I mean, in the retail world, there's nobody bigger than Walmart, right? So the fact that we are in green and part of their uh, you know, internal workflow to make things uh, you know, better for their customers, I think is, I think is huge. So it's, it's not so much a singular, this is the brand we need to put on our list and I say, we got it. Uh, but I think it's more how wide can we go in terms of what we mm. offer to our customers. Now, we are being challenged and we, we exist in a business that's constantly evolving. Now, uh, we're dealing with uh, technology that's, that, that's coming on board. We're dealing with you know, what's the impact of AI going to be on our business. Mm -hmm. uh, we're dealing with you know, how is e-commerce going to change? How are people going to shop? What are consumers looking for? So all along the ways, we have to remain relevant. And we have to pivot and do new things that, uh, you know, serve our customers and maintain our value to them. Otherwise, well, yeah, yeah I used to go to GeekSpeak for this, but now I could just go to AI to do that. Why am I going for that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're doing something else that, you know, you know, cannot be replicated, right? So uh, in terms of North Star, I think it's just really remaining uh, relevant and, and really scaling mm -hmm. in terms of where we are. Love that. Yeah. Love that. Because sometimes we do have that North Star. You touched on AI and there was a question. So perfect segue. Yep. Uh, and then we're going to do some closing questions because I have to be careful of the time. I want to make sure people network. Sure. Um, do you use AI tools? So one of the examples Stacy mentioned was chat GPT. I yep. have no idea what that is. And I know we can't get into explaining it, but yeah. AI in general, do you think um, entrepreneurs should be using it? And what gives, does it give you that competitive edge and save time or is there a detraction? Yeah, I'll, I'll say absolutely. And before I get to that answer, I'll, I'll give you a bit, a bit uh, back of the history. Okay. So uh, ChatGPT is part of a, a, a segment of artificial intelligence called natural language innovation, right? Or natural language processing. So uh, about seven years ago, you know, we recognize that the work we were doing, particularly in content creation, had a lot of opportunities for automation, right? Because you know, when you look at a product page, a lot of the information you receive, there's some repeatability in terms of how it's structured, right? So we thought early on that, okay, there's something here. So, uh, we, so we, we, we had a prototype seven years ago called Coffee Table, right? Which was going to be an automated system that was going to create product content. Fast forward uh, about uh, four years ago, we brought on you know, two data scientists who were to, literally hired uh, to create uh, these, these models to be able to replicate this content. So we were you know, sponsored by, uh, by our Industry Canada to essentially research an early version of what is now ChatGPT. So we, we, we trained the models and we, we, we didn't go that scale in terms of where they are. But we had data scientists actually building those algorithms in order to do that. So, 
you know, we, we got as far as we did and, and our system was kind of, we put it on the market, we got integrated into Shopify. And then in November, OpenAI AI releases this massive model that's trained on millions and millions of parameters. Uh, but we, we had, we may have had hundreds of thousands that had like millions and millions that is just amazing and beautiful. So uh, to answer the question, it is a path that we as a company have been on for a long time. Yeah. Uh, we were pleasantly surprised with what uh, OpenAI released, uh, particularly with, with ChatGPT. So as it stands right now, we are looking to integrate this technology into our earlier versions of the system we were building. So it's going to be part of our workflow. It just means we could do a lot work faster. We could certainly manage the quality of what we're producing. And we could scale in terms of what we could produce for our clients. So. Uh, we're still a very human-centric system in terms of the work we do uh, because our customers are very unique and very particular uh, from a style guide standpoint and, and what they want to hear in terms of the, their product set. But we certainly want to make that part of you know, our ability to scale. So that's sort of on the business side. Now, when it comes to can I, as an entrepreneur, do my job better using uh, you know, some of the automation capabilities within uh, ChatGPT, I'd say absolutely. I've told my entire team that you need to have this uh, in, in, in your process, understand what it does, understand how you could use it, understand how to make it work better. Because, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, you either roll with technology or it rolls over you, uh, so to speak. And this is one of those uh, critical components or critical moments in, uh, uh, in, in human technology that uh, cannot be ignored. So as a tech business, as a content business, uh, it's certainly uh, something that has been, a build up for us and we're really excited about what the potential uh you know could be here wow i, I think you could speak about ai like a whole oh, yeah, okay. hosted uh hosted event it's, not it's, write that down spark yeah, it's, um it's two great. more questions yep i'm getting the time you got okay, yeah part. i know we could talk forever okay yeah. two more questions future state yeah what's next for you in geek speak yeah so uh we're uh, getting involved in a lot of uh, interesting uh, interesting areas. Uh, uh, we are started over the past 12 months, we invested heavily uh, into augmented reality and 3D. Uh, this is a space where uh, we think uh, a lot of our brands and, and customers and retailers are going to be uh, looking support on. So uh, everything from you know, modeling products so they're easier to view online to uh, augmented reality experiences. So, you know, you hold up your phone and you walk into this awesome portal. And now you're looking at all the products that are out there. We want to be the company that you know, brands are going for to do that. We want those capabilities. So we've been building that. I'm sorry to look into that. So we will continue uh, to evolve uh, as a business. I think we'll always be core to, uh, you know, the retail space and the e-commerce space and, and the online merchandising space. Uh, still very much a, a digital company. I will still continue to be innovators, which I think uh, sets us apart. We're not standing in the same river uh, as we were, and we, in our future state, that's, that's where we, we want to continue to be. And of course, yeah. uh, we want to continue to be in Durham and help <laughs> Durham uh, continue to be uh, yes. a, a place business want to locate. So that's part of, uh, part of our strategy for sure. Awesome. Okay, so that's what's next. If, right. For the entrepreneurs listening, yep. sort of what are your final thoughts? If you, you know, what's, what do you want them to, to remember or consider? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, the, I think that the message is, first of all, if you're kind of thinking about this, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sitting on the fence. Uh, I, I said, launch something, get out there, do it, put it out in, in the world and, and see what happens. I think that's number one. Uh, but if you're a little bit further down uh, the journey, I think it's important to remember that, you know, sometimes you hear somebody who's been in it for 20 years and, and as long as they have, you're like, oh my God. This is this is where I want to be. You don't realize it's a long, uh, you know, journey. It's, it's not a it's, it's not a get rich quick tomorrow <laughs> type thing. What? Uh, it is something that's gonna take time to grow. Your customers need to know that you're gonna be there tomorrow, and that's just time. Uh, you're gonna become good at what you do. You're gonna become better than your competitors. Your competitors are gonna fall off. Uh, there's customers who are gonna be here and gone tomorrow. But if you're committed to it, you have to understand that uh, it's going to take that time. And, and that's, I think, something that we're not told us about mm -hmm. entrepreneurship. We're talking about, oh, do this. You can do this tomorrow. But it's it's not like that at all. And I think that's probably something important to remember. Well, thank you very much for those parting thoughts. 
Uh, and thank you for spending a bit of time with us today. Uh, it is very, it's very hard. much appreciated. It, we're done. I, I have stuff I have to read now. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> but awesome. I do. I, um, often people don't uh, realize how valuable these kinds of opportunities are. So I just, I just wanted to acknowledge that uh, the business community always appreciates you spending time with them. And uh, we, yeah, we could have, we could have chatted forever. I think spark could do a deep dive on each of the questions that we just talked about and spent uh, an hour with you, but I'd book you up for the next few weeks and keep you too busy. Uh, okay. Congratulations. Congratulations on your 20th anniversary. Uh, and I have a feeling based on everything you've just said and teased us with, you're just getting started. So um, we're, we were very pleased to host you today. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Natalie. And thanks, everybody. We'll see you soon. Thank you. And ready to network, everyone. Okay. So we're going to end the session. And here are my closing remarks. And I'm going to talk to you about jumping into networking. Again, this is Startup Grind, proudly presented by Spark Center. And we'd like to say Spark, thank you to Spark Center's elite partners. So Bearskin and Par LLP, Finance Without Borders, RDP Associates, Layton, Suresh Law, Real Estate Refurbished, and Gold, Coldwell Banker. Sorry, real estate refresh, not refurbished. That there are two different. Those are two different words. Um, so the next startup grind is an exciting pitch event with contestants from across Eastern Ontario Innovation Corridor. It's taking place on Thursday, May twenty fifth. So be sure to visit the Spark Center social pages for more details and how to register. So time for networking. I'm going to age myself a little because it is kind of like speed dating. This is a very cool platform. If you've not been on before, uh, relax. It's super fun. So you are going to navigate this section by clicking on the networking icon to the left of your screen. You're going to be paired up with one person at a time. So for about three minutes, there is a counter. You can even extend the time if you want to continue your conversation. So you don't have to talk really, really fast. You can extend the time and actually get to know someone if uh, if there's an interest there. And once the time is up, you just press ready and hop in will automatically move you to the next person. So you click the connect button. And if you'd like to exchange content with anyone, you can do that or just put your uh, information into the chat. Thanks. And I will see you there.